Afghanistan has been ruled by the Taliban since 1996. Since then, the movement has been trying to create what it sees as the world's purest Islamic state. Earlier this month, the Taliban destroyed two giant Buddha statues and other objects at an ancient site of Bamiyan. And they've been linked with Arab radicals such as Osama bin Laden. Joining me now from Washington, Syed Ramatullah Hashimi. He is a representative of Afghanistan's foreign ministry and a special assistant to the spiritual leader of the Taliban, Mullah Omar. Here in New York with me, Barnett Rubin. He is the director of studies at the Center on International Cooperation at New York University. He's also the author of several books on Afghanistan, and I am pleased to have both of them here, uh, both in Washington and New York. And in the interest of, of time, we will uh, refer to each other uh, in, in the shortest abbreviation possible. Mr. Hashimi, let me start with you. Tell me why you're in New York, in America, and, and what it is you hope to uh, accomplish. Well, uh, I was here to deliver a letter through the State Department to the new administ uh, administration in uh, Washington, hoping that the policies of the United States towards the region, in particular to our country, will at least be rethought. So. In the meantime, I was giving some talks uh, in some schools uh, here, which I did. Uh, this characterize the United States' relationship to your government? Well, there is, uh, after the Soviet withdrawal, the United States just uh, ignored Afghanistan and all those problems that uh, were there. So uh, many of those problems has been resolved now, like the reunification of that country and uh, disarming the people, uh, the opium eradication and is uh, having one administration. Now there is one problem that is the terrorism existence of bin Laden in Afghanistan. And we have been telling people that <coughs> if anybody can give us some kind of evidence, we will resolve this problem. Uh, but so far we have uh, not been given any kind of evidence that shows that bin Laden is actually a terrorist. Is it your position that bin Laden does not uh, is not a terrorist, and, and your, your government's position that he is in fact not a terrorist, and that he is in fact not taken credit for terrorist acts, and that he does not, uh, uh, both in his rhetoric, suggest terrorist acts against the United States? Well, he says that he has done nothing, and we don't know anything. If anybody claims that he is a terrorist, should prove it. Well, but his rhetoric suggests that he is, does it not? He, no, we have, we have not, not seen anything that, so, that shows that he is a terrorist. We have said that he is not even allowed to be politically active against any country. Let me come back to him because there are a lot of other things, as you know, because we have uh, trials going on in the United States in which people are alleging uh, connections and that kind of thing. I'll come back to that. But you are meeting with people at the State Department and talking about your government's position uh, on bin Laden as well as other issues? Exactly. We have said that we have given three proposals to the United States so far. Uh, one of that was that we will try him in Afghanistan, provided that we are given evidence. Uh, that was rejected. Uh, we gave a second proposal in which we asked the United States that if they think he's a threat to the U.S. security, they have to send international monitoring group to watch him for the rest of his life so that he has nothing and meets nobody. That was also rejected. And we gave a third proposal in which we asked three countries, uh, Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, and a third Islamic country selected by the United States to decide his future so that we have some kind of, uh, some kind of uh, justifications to our people uh, so that they, this man is a not a good guy and he should be expelled or extradited or whatever. But we have not been assisted in this sector. And for the fourth time, I was here again asking the U.S. government to at least open the doors of negotiations on bin Laden issue. All right, we'll come back to bin Laden. Just one quick question before I go to Mr. Rubin and other things. Uh, do you... Uh, acknowledge the fact that Mr. Bin Laden pays um, your government for his protection in Afghanistan? That's absolutely wrong. He has not that much to pay us. So he stays there uh, under the protection of the Taliban because what? He was in Afghanistan 17 years before we existed. Such people were instigated to go to Afghanistan and fight the Soviet Union. And such people were called the heroes of independence, not by us. Such people were called the heroes of independence by the President of the United States, by Mr. Ronald Reagan. And all of a sudden, they have changed to terrorists. Okay, if he is a terrorist, how are you going to justify trying to kill a man without even giving him a fair trial? The United States tried to kill him without even telling us that he is a terrorist. 
all these things have aggravated the situation. He was nobody and he has been made a hero now. He has been made so famous. 6,000 children were named after him in Pakistan only. And so many restaurants, cars, shoes, jackets, all these things. So this is not our creation. All right, we still have not yet come to the issue of the Buddhist statues, and I'll do that after giving uh, Mr. Rubin a chance to talk about the things that we have been uh, speaking about so far. Tell me what, how you see this and what the United States position is likely to be and, and whether uh, Hashimi will meet any success in, with his audience at the State Department. Well, I think this discussion exemplifies the problem with U.S. policy toward Afghanistan, which is that for several years we have not really had a policy toward Afghanistan. We have had a policy toward Osama bin Laden because Osama bin Laden is a person and a symbol of a phenomenon that the uni United States thinks is a direct threat to it because of the bombings in Africa, because of other activities of which he is accused. I don't have access to that secret information that shows that he is a terrorist. There's a trial going on here. But I think the important point is what is the context in which this is taking place. And the context is a country that the major world powers have spent billions and billions of dollars to destroy for over 20 years. A country which was one of the poorest countries in the world at that time and which has lost much of what they had both in buildings, roads, government structures, and most important, people and educated people. So that someone like Mr. Hashimi, who is a 24-year-old former refugee, is one of the most polished and educated people that the current authorities in Afghanistan have to send to the outside world. Because all the other people who were educated and were specialists were killed, jailed, or expelled, and are living as refugees in various places. Now, that is a context in which any assistance is welcome. It's a context, it's an extreme context in which extremist ideologies may seem to some people much more rational because they are dealing with a very extreme situation. And if someone comes to them and fights on, on their side and is willing to assist them, and they are not getting what they see as significant assistance from other people, the people who helped them destroy the country as part of their civil war, then they will welcome that person. That is what is now happening. The Taliban's original agenda was not to support international terrorism. Now I believe the Taliban as an organization is allied with people who are guilty of international terrorism. People who, as Mr. Hashimi correctly says, were originally recruited to come by the U.S., Saudi Arabia, and Pakistan to fight in that war, were given that training and supported to do that. Now they have turned against us, we have turned against them, but what we are, and we are having a dialogue of the deaf about this subject in which I'm not supporting the Taliban's position, but we are not addressing the major problem, which is the destruction of that country, the death of millions of its people, the huge drought, which is making hundreds of thousands of people into displaced people. And if we did address those, that would change the terms of the discussion. Right, I'll come back. I'm, I'm going to have to come back to Osama bin Laden in just a moment. But, but what, are the, the, what we should be addressing is what, this gov what the American government's uh, policy is with respect to Afghanistan and whether it can do a uh, send aid because of the drought and and the destruction I assume you're talking about is what I assume you're talking about the destruction of the Buddhist the Buddhist no, statute no, I'm, or you're talking uh, about no, the destruction of something else I'm talking about the destruction of virtually everything that was of value in Afghanistan over the past 20 years are you talking about destruction by the war but all the, the war with the Russians and the war in, and the civil war and what are you talking about that's right the war with the Soviets the civil war among the various groups, the criminal activities culminating in this criminal destruction of world heritage that just took place. But if you drive around Afghanistan, all the roads are destroyed to the point that there are small children standing by the roads who should be in school, picking up dirt with their bare hands and throwing it on the huge potholes which are bigger than the paved parts in the hope that a passing trucker, who is probably a smuggler of some kind because no one else has the money to uh, drive trucks, will give them a little money, maybe the equivalent of one cent or five cents, in return for throwing this dirt on the road. And mostly they don't get that. So that, if you go to the capital, Kabul, you will see that, I don't know, 50 percent, 60 percent of the buildings are in complete ruins. They're whole neighborhoods that are completely desolated by rockets and missiles that we paid for with our tax dollars and that our uh, allies uh, also paid for and that the Soviets also sent there and that today those missiles are still being sent there to the Taliban and the other side by the neighboring countries and which is turning not only Afghanistan but the entire region around it.
including Pakistan and Central Asia, into a very dangerous area where conflict is spreading and where nuclear weapons are, are located in a number in, of countries. In Pakistan. In Pakistan, and there are also some in Kazakhstan. Characterize as well. the Taliban for me. Um, the Taliban are a transnational organization which arose originally in Afghanistan. They represent the traditional rural mullahs of southern Afghanistan um, who are linked very closely to some of their colleagues in Pakistan itself uh, through a number of madrasas, Islamic academies, where they study. This is a social group that every government in Afghanistan for the last 100 years tried to marginalize and put out of power. But as a result of this war, most of the other elites that had come to power, the secular educated people, the Soviet educated Western people, have been eliminated. Furthermore, uh, these people who arose in response to the situation of chaos and violence in southern Afghanistan have then been built up and used and manipulated by the Pakistan intelligence services and the Pakistan government in order to take over Afghanistan and put in place a government which will be sympathetic to Pakistan and which serves Pakistan's interests. They have Im imposed on Afghanistan um, a kind of vision which is typical of their social origin, that is these rural uh, Islamic leaders, but in turn radicalized by this experience of war, and which is very different from and opposed to the views of what kind of government there should be among the urban population, the educated population, and the other ethnic groups in the country. A couple of quick questions about other personalities. One, uh, Mr. Massoud, what do you make of him? Um, again, Massoud is a great guerrilla commander who resisted the Soviets. What he has turned into, however, is essentially a kind of ethnic leader. What he represents is uh, it now is he is, res he is organizing resistance among Persian-speaking people in North Afghanistan. This has to do with the way Afghanistan is structured as a state. When Mr. Hashmi says they have imposed a single administration on Afghanistan or re-established it, um, that is correct to some extent. However, they impose this by force, and this administration represents the views of a very narrow segment of the population. But it's also true that before they did this, there was no administration in most of Afghanistan, and there was a kind of chaos and anarchy. Massoud constructed a structure in one part of the country. Now, what many Afghans would like is for Afghanistan to be constructed out of those different communities. Massoud could be a part of that as representative of his own region and community. But he is too caught up in this geopolitical game, and he is being supported by Iran, Russia, the Central Asian states, who are trying to resist Pakistan, which is using the Taliban, to carry out its own policy in Afghanistan. Massoud knows, in fact, that he is not an alternative to the Taliban. Um, because he, he doesn't have a big enough ethnic base, and he's never going to have a big enough support base. Um, but he is hoping that there will be a split in the Taliban, or that something will happen that will enable him to break out of the spot that he is in right now. But uh, I was before I, before I go back to Mr. Uh, Hashimi. Do you have any doubt that Osama bin Laden is a terrorist? No. You don't. No. It's clear to you. Yes. Why isn't it clear to Mr. Hashimi? Well, he should speak for himself, but although I could respond. You could what? Okay, go ahead. I mean, let's come back to Osama bin Laden, then we'll come to, the, to Massoud and other issues that we spoke to. Go ahead. And who supports whom? You're asking me? Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, I was surprised how much Mr. Robin knows about the region, and I really appreciate some of his views. But there are things that he said that I will not principally agree upon. So he said that uh, the Taliban were established by the ISI of Pakistan or the intelligence of Pakistan, which I don't think is right. Our good relations with Pakistan does not mean that we are their puppets. We want good relations with everybody, uh, with, particularly with, with our neighbors, and Pakistan is very crucial in them. So we have said that our good relations with somebody does not mean that we are their puppets. And if we were going to be somebody's puppets, then we would be American puppets than, uh, than becoming Pakistan's puppets. So all, I've, all I have to say is that who, we don't say we are perfect. We say that who could do better than we did? We reunified that country that was almost fragmented formally. We eradicated the opium cultivation. Afghanistan was producing 75% of all world's drugs. So we finished it in one year. We disarmed people. The United Nations couldn't do it. In 1992, the United Nations passed an appeal asking for three billion dollars to repurchase those arms and certainly it was impracticable they couldn't do it and we did it in no in, in no time and very easily and spending not even a penny on that so 
95% of the people are disarmed now. So all you can see is that who could do better than we did? 